This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Always, I'm your host, Jesse Tapia. All right, so Markel Fotes, back in the news again. We're going to be talking about him for this first segment. Later on in the show, for the second segment, I should say, we're going to be talking about the NBA games from last night. Talk about the Lakers' big win over the Thunder, even though Westbrook and Melo didn't play. Talk about the Celtics' nice little OT win over the Wizards. I think there was a, I can't remember exactly who else played. i got to double check it, but nonetheless, we'll talk about the rest of the games too. Third segment, we're going to be talking about... Um, the Ravens and John Harbaugh. I think, honestly, I have this little thing in my mind. If the Ravens don't make the playoffs, then John Harbaugh won't be back. So we'll talk about pretty much the Ravens' future for this season, what they need to do and all that. So just spend like a Ravens segment in the third. And then for the fourth segment, we're going to be talking about anything else going on in the world of sports. I think Ray Jones Jr. I know we were talking about him yesterday. I think he had a fight last night. I think his last fight was last night. So I'm going to need to double check on that. And if it was, we'll be talking about him. We're also going to talk about pretty much like a little weekend preview for the things that are going on. Plus, like I said, we'll talk about anything else going on in sports. So, that's how the show is going to go today. All right, let's talk about the Sixers. Let's talk about Fultz, and let's talk about Brian Quangelo. So, Sixers GM came out today, talked again about Fultz, and this whole little Markel Fultz situation is really weird. I think it's more of a it's like a mental thing for Fultz, and that's why he's not out there anymore. All right. So as we know, Fultz started off the season, played four games, and then has been shut down ever since then. All right, They tried telling us, the Sixers meaning, that it was a shoulder injury and that's what pretty much caused him to be out. And if you remember, like there's a certain way that Fultz shot the ball in college with Washington, and then there was a completely different way he was shooting the ball with the Sixers All right, while he was playing. Remember when he was shooting his free throws? I don't know, it was the most awkward thing I've ever seen in my life, how he shot it pretty much like... Like would be like a robot going through each motion robotically. All right, so he was doing that. And then I remember talking about it in the beginning, like during that time, talking about how if he's hurt, just um, just shut him down and don't bring him back until he's 100% healthy. Well, it turns out that he might not even be like hurt anymore. And this is probably just a mind thing for Fultz, all right? Because I think he did, like, it's weird because we're not sure if, his shooting motion is what caused the shoulder injury or if the shooting injury like if the shoulder injury caused him to change his mechanics and his shooting style all right this whole little situation is so odd and weird all right i mean this is the type of story right here where ESPN makes a 30 for 30 about it in like what 5 6 years since he'll be out of the league if that's how it's going right now I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous, like how it's all going. Like no one's on the same page as far as talking about him. Brian Quangelo will talk about. I read an article earlier today from one of the Philly writers talking about how um, Quangelo said that uh, what was it? I remember off the top of my head that oh yeah, that Fultz could be back soon, or he could just be out for the rest of the season. That makes no sense to me. All right, at all. If he could be back soon, that means he's healthy. If he could be out for the rest of the season, that means he's not healthy. Like I said, this whole thing is just, a, just it's like all over the place, all right? I mean, Colangelo said too in practice that Fultz is just shooting from the paint right now. He's not shooting anything beyond there. No mid-range, no three-point shots, all right? And, I mean, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get how this, just pretty much how this happened. I'm not sure... If Fultz just got frozen and now he can't handle anything, or if he's like, I don't know. I mean, if he's only taking shots from the paint, obviously that sounds like, sounds like his shoulder is still hurt, but the GM ain't saying that. He's not saying that he's still hurt, okay? I think there was one, let me see if I could find one of the articles. 
um, said that asked if he was medically 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 cleared, and he said that's not necessarily like what has to do with faults being out. So from what like that little let's take that little piece right there, right? Faults like whether or not he's medically cleared, and then Coangelo is saying that isn't necessarily tied to him returning into court. What that tells me right there is that I think he is medically cleared, but he's got some little mental issue he's got to deal with as far as shooting the ball. All right, I'm not sure if like he did have a shoulder injury. And again, this is all just like pure speculation here because there's no concrete fact about what's going on with Mark Fultz at the moment. All right, so I'm not sure if like maybe it was a type where he got the shoulder injury and it was so bad to where I mean he had to shoot the ball a different way and he's scared of shooting the ball back to how he used to because he's want to get the shoulder injury again or maybe the NBA is just too big for him like too much of a spotlight for him but I'm not sure this is just ridiculous like I said he's only shooting from the paint and I think it was uh Brett Brown who said that he's um he's not doing conditioning drills and then Coangelo said that that like he didn't know anything about that's so, like obviously Philly right now isn't in on the same page as far as Mark Markel faults all right and now you got a bunch of analysts and writers saying that you know Coangelo could be out of there by meaning losing his GM job after this season just because of how this is all went down and again I'm not sure really what caused it or anything like that but I don't know this is one of the weirdest stories of the year I guess because Markel Fultz, remember, in, like in Washington, obviously it was just last year, but I mean, he was scoring. He was a three-tier type scorer. Right? He could score in the paint, could score mid-range, could shoot the three ball. I think he shot what was it, forty-one percent percent from three. And now all of a sudden, the dude just—it's like it's in Space Jam when the monsters take all their talent. That's pretty much what it is right there. All right, they took Markel Fultz's talent, and now he doesn't know what to do. And this kind of stinks because I kind of want Markel. Like I want. I want to see Markel Fultz out there. I thought he was a good player in Washington and. He was a real fun player. I remember like the little rivalry he had started with Lonzo talking about how Lonzo wouldn't be better than him in the NBA or anything like that. And the guy hasn't even played. All right. And like now you got like I remember reading in the Philly article too that there was a video of J.J. Redick yelling at reporters saying that he was only 19 and stuff like that. Because I guess in at practice and stuff like that, that's all the media is focused on right there. Just taking videos of Markel Fultz looking at how he shoots and just pretty much focusing on him the entire time. And J.J. Redick went out there and saying he's only 19. I think that helps solidify a bit that this is more of a mental type thing instead of, uh, yeah, his shoulders hurt. I think that Markel Fultz is currently shook. And for those who don't know what shook means, it means like he can't snap out of what he's got right now. All right. Whatever little mo mood or zone he's in right now, he can't get out of it. And it's not necessarily a good thing, too. So I'm not sure what really goes on there. And if Fultz, let's say Fultz just, let's go hypotheticals right here, okay? Let's say that Fultz doesn't return this season. I guess that's fine or whatever. Philly will have a nice little lot. We'll have a lottery pick, all right? Because I don't think they make the playoffs this year with the Pistons playing as well as they are right now, especially with Blake Griffin. All right, and they're going to have Reggie Jackson coming back soon. And Stanley Johnson looking like he's starting to improve a whole lot more in the offensive end. But let's say Fultz doesn't come back. All right, Philly gets a lottery pick. It's obviously not going to be a high top five pick or anything like that because Philly's just going to barely miss out on the playoffs, if anything. So they'll probably have a pick with, with, with a top 15 or top 14, get lottery picks. So probably around the 13 to 10 range, something like that, probably. They'll get a player, but I think that Fultz not being out there, like, yeah, let's say they get the player or whatever, and next year comes, and Fultz still hasn't figured it out, and he's back out there. But, I mean, you can just tell, like, he's still mentally out of it, and the moment's too big for him, and just Fultz doesn't turn out to have a solid career. This could kill the little rebuild that the Sixers had. All right, because obviously, I mean, Ben Simmons is just a rookie right now, and obviously he has time to get better and all that, but he's been playing really well. Joel Embiid already looks like one of the top five centers in the league when he's healthy, and he has been for most of the season. And they're still barely fighting for a playoff spot with guys like Robert Covington, Dario Saric, and J.J. Redick. All right, I think their plan was to have Fultz as the final piece to finally pretty much finish that rebuild. Obviously, they wouldn't be a top five team in the East or anything like that, let's say, if Fultz was playing well. But they're expected to be a team maybe from the eighth or fifth to sixth seed or fifth to eighth seed range, something like that, and pretty much just consistently, get, consistently getting better and pr pretty much making it more towards getting to a top four seed year after year. If Fultz doesn't come back and pretty much, let's say he does, but is not the player they expected him to be, then this little rebuild gets set back a couple years, I think. All right, because they're good enough to where, as of right now, they're good enough to where they could fight for an eighth seed. But 
if Fultz doesn't come back and he doesn't play well, that's all they're going to be for the next few years. The team who fights for an AFC year after year, unless somehow miraculously they maybe trade for a guy like Campbell Walker in the offseason. They, they, that's what it's going to take to get Philly over the hump. All right? Like I said, it was supposed to be Markel Fultz. It was supposed to be Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid as the core three. That's what it was supposed to be. Then you got Sarich and Covington as your um, little role players right there too as in the starting five. And then you fix the bench as you go. But with Fultz being out and him not pretty much being able to contribute to this team, that sets the real build back, all right? It's going to be, like, like, this whole, like I said, this whole situation is weird. I mean, I've, I've never seen anything like it, all right? The Sixers can't get their story straight as to what's going on. And, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I think on Tuesday, Markel Fultz talked to the NBA on TNT guys, and he was telling that, when there's like this whole process he's going through is going to make him a better player when he gets back and all that. But like, when are you going to come back? All right. If Quangelo's out there saying that, oh yeah, he can be back soon or he can miss the season. What does that mean? All right. Is the guy hurt or is he just, is he just mentally shook? All right. Because I mean, if he's hurt, then just go out and say, yeah, we're shutting him down for the season, rest of the season. If he's mentally shook, then say, you know what? You know what Philly should do? They should just are they you know they should just sh- um, shut him down for the rest of the season. Hurt or not, just shut him down. Be like, you know what, it didn't work this year. All right, keep coming to practice, keep working on your shot, get more comfortable, get more confident, and then when you're ready for next year, we'll bring you out here. All right, because obviously with how it's going, I mean, as it is right now, if I had to put money on it, I don't see him coming back this season really um, to come play for this team. Even like let's say like Philly is fighting for a playoff spot. And that Markel Fultz is just messed up mentally, then that's not the place to put him in. All right, don't put him in with a team who's going to be making the playoffs. Let's say they do make the playoffs and they bring Fultz. I mean, that's just going to hurt his confidence even more because the dude, I guess, his confidence is all messed up or mentally or whatever is messed up. Um, the playoffs isn't something for for um, to fix that. So I say, you know what? Just shut him down for the rest of the year. Work with him. Work on his shot. I'm not sure because like it's too. It's like with the muscle memory they're saying too and stuff like that. Like he's got it like pretty much like he forgot how to shoot the ball. This is basically what I'm getting for this from this too. The guy just forgot how to shoot the basketball, forgot how to play basketball. I said everything else he can do fine. I mean, he could run, he could guard and pass and all that, but he just does not know how to shoot the ball anymore is what I'm getting from it, from reading all this stuff about him. And I'm not sure how that happens. Again, I think, I think more it goes to either like he did have the shoulder injury, like that was a problem, and it hurt so bad to where he had to change his – um shooting mechanics and now he's all healed up but he doesn't want to change his shooting mechanics back just because of the fact that um he doesn't want to go back to the injury that he had so maybe it's i think that's it's something like that i mean again i'm just pretty much giving my opinion just guessing right here but i mean that's all you could do with this whole markel fold situation no one knows what's going on it's pretty much i don't know it's like they got they need to keep him behind closed doors too whenever the media goes out there for practice for whatever period of time that is they need to have markel Fultz pretty much sitting down or doing something else besides shooting the ball because i mean it's like i've seen it on twitter and stuff like that the little clips of Fultz shooting the ball during practice it still doesn't look good it still looks kind of weird like yeah it goes in and like you, like i was there was one video where he's shooting the ball weird but it's going in but nonetheless it's not a good shooting motion so i think they just need to pull him aside when the media's out there recording just so he doesn't have to worry about that and when they're gone boom go back and work on the shot so i mean that's all i got to really say on it this whole situation is more of like a fluid type thing like i said i mean quenzel says that he could be out there soon i mean like a like a day to day type of thing or he could just be out for the rest of the season it's just a matter of how Fultz feels i guess so that's all i gotta say about that next up we're gonna be talking about the nba games from yesterday which was thursday we're gonna recap those so stay tuned and we'll be right back are you looking for the very best nfl and college football podcast then check out the gsmc football podcast get the latest football news both on and off the field from the nfl draft to trades to the rumor mill to the nfl combines they got you covered that's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast get updates on college rivalries game day insights and much much more it's football talk the way you want it this show eats sleeps and breathes football don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All
right, and welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast. We spent that first segment talking about pretty much this whole little weird Markel Fultz 76er situation. Not really sure what to make of it. I mean, like everything anyone has to say about it as far as anyone besides from the 76ers organization, it's all just opinion right now. No one knows exactly what's going on there. All right. And I think that Philly does like, I don't know, like I'm just thinking about it more and stuff like that. And from like how Philly's talking and stuff like that, as far as Brian Coangelo and pretty much the team itself, I mean, it sounds like there's some, like it's either like the dude's confidence is just shook and done, or there's some way worse that's going on besides um what's going on, like from what they're telling us as far as him just trying to fix his mechanics and all that. So, I mean, this whole situation, like I'm trying to think about it and trying to put it together and just trying to figure out like pretty much, you know, just trying to make sense of it and you can't, there's no way. It's just this way this, everything has worked out has just been weird. It's just been weird. All right. Nonetheless, though, let's talk about the NBA games from Thursday night. Starting off, we had the Boston Celtics facing off with the Washington Wizards. This game was in Washington and Boston won this one 110-104 in overtime. Washington did have a solid chance of winning this one. Towards the end of the game, when they were, they were down like 10 points with three minutes left, they came back and just Bradley Bill could not hit a shot to save his life in crutch time. I mean, there was like, he had plenty of open shots too. It's not like, oh, like he's got a hand in his face every time. The dude had open shots, like about four or five open shots in crunch time, whether it be last few minutes of the fourth quarter, or last few minutes of overtime, and he just couldn't sink them. But let's get into the stats real quick. We had Al Horford for the Celtics with 12 points, seven rebounds, two assists, five of eight from the field, one of four from the three-point line. Jason Tatum, only 11 points, two rebounds, shot three of nine, 0 of three from the three-point line. Kyrie Irving, 28 points, six assists, five rebounds, nine of 19 from the field, one of five from the three-point line. Jalen Brown, 18 points, four rebounds, three assists, 7 of 16 from the field, 3 of 8 from the 3-point line. Off the bench, you had Marcus Morris with a nice game from him, 15 points, 8 rebounds, 5 of 14 shooting, 1 of 2 from the 3-point line. Then you had uh, Greg Monroe in his debut with the Celtics. Looked good out there. I mean, played 20 minutes, but was out there hustling, was out there diving for loose balls too. Had a nice little rim protect, um, was a good rim protector for them during the game. He had 5 points, 6 rebounds, shot 2 of 5, and then Terry Rozier playing well off the bench now. 12 points, 2 rebounds, shot 4 of 6, 2 of 2 from the 3-point line. Then for the Wizards, you had Marcus Morris, 9 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists, fouled out on that one, 3 of 6 from the field, 1 of 2 from the 3-point line. Uh, Sadoransky, the new... Um, Starting point guard with John Wall out, had 14 points, 4 rebounds, 4 assists, 6 of 12 shooting, 2 of 2 from the 3-point line. That guy, I don't really know too much about him, but I was watching him guard Kyrie yesterday and pretty much had watching him play against this little Celtics defense, and that dude looked good. All right, Kyrie got past him a few times, but he's going to do that against anyone. So, I mean, the fact that like he did come up with some stops on Kyrie, did have a couple of steals against them too. So, like I said, he just played really well. Uh, Washington with this guy... They're not going to, like I said, when Wall went down, that they're going to start going down, like pretty much start playing poorly. But if this guy can continues to play like how he did yesterday, they're going to be just fine, I feel. Then you had Otto Porter, who was hitting every shot. It seemed like he had 27 points, 11 rebounds, 2 assists, 9 of 18 from the field shooting, 3 of 5 from the three-point line. Bradley Bill, like I said, not a great shooting night from him in crunch time, and just overall in the game. He only had 18 points, 9 assists, 5 rebounds, shot 7 of 27, and 3 of 9 from the three-point line. So like I said, just not a great game from him. All right, so listen. I think it was about six seconds left in the game. Boston's like um, Wizards are up like six seconds left in the fourth quarter, I should say. Wizards are up by three. I think it's one hundred two to one or ninety nine, or it's either one hundred three to one hundred. Either way, Wizards are up by three. All right, Kyrie gets the ball from the inbounds pass, takes it to the corner. All right, um, goes up for the shot. Misses, but there's a foul called on there, right? Marcus Morris hit him on the elbow. I mean, it's one of those like little ticky tack fouls right there, kind of like just swiped him. I'm not sure if it really affected him or anything like that, but nonetheless, you can't touch the guy when he's taking a shot. So Kyrie goes to the line, hits both free throw or hits all three free throws. Then I think there's like three seconds left, something like that. And uh, Bradley Bill has a chance to hit the game winner. I think there was more time left on the on the clock too for the Celtics. I think six seconds wasn't a, like was um, a little less than or a little yeah a little less than what they actually had. But nonetheless, Bradley Bill gets a chance to hit the game winning shot at the end of the fourth quarter. And I mean, Celtics played good on defense. I think they had Terry Rozier and Kyrie on him. Uh, they set a screen on Rozier, so Bradley Bill gets a little bit free, but then Kyrie goes up, gets a hand in his face, and Bradley Bill misses it. So overtime comes, and 
Marcus Morris, once again, fouls Kyrie Irving on a three. Kyrie hits those um, three shots right there. Marcus Morris um, fouls out. It's pretty much like a really bad mental lapse from him, too. He just really couldn't put his hand on straight. Like, just don't touch Kyrie when he's shooting the ball. He's not shooting the ball well from the three-point line either. Like I said, he finished the game. What was it? One for five, I think it was. Yeah, one for five. So I don't get why you're hitting him as far as um, on the three-point line, whether or not it's ticky-tack call or just barely swiping him. But nonetheless, you know you can't do that. So either way, overtime keeps going on, and the Wizards just could not buy a bucket when they needed one. All right, they were keeping it close. Like I said, when it was time to finally take the lead or hit, the, hit a game time bucket for momentum, they just couldn't do it at all. Bradley Bill couldn't hit a shot to save his life. And pretty much Otto Porter, like he was doing all right, but didn't really do too much in overtime. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why the Wizards lost right there. But, again, the Celtics right there, they got to... You got to finish those games because if you're up by 10 with three minutes left, then I mean, it shouldn't get to overtime. But nonetheless, it did, and they ended up winning the game either way. So, like I said, they won 110 to 104. Then we had the Atlanta Hawks facing off with the Orlando Magic in Orlando, and the Magic won that one 198. For the Hawks, we had Aaron Ilyasova with 5 points, 4 rebounds, 2 of 4 from the field. Let's see, you had Tarion Prince with 19 points, 5 assists, 7 of 12 shooting, 4 of 7 from the three point line. Dennis Schroeder, not a good game from. Um, not a good game shooting from him. He only had 19 points, 5 assists, 5 rebounds, 5 of 15 from the field, 2 of 4 from the 3-point line. Then you had Kent Bazemore. Once again, not a good shooting game from him. Only 6 points, 4 rebounds, 4 assists, 3 of 11 from the field, 0 of 3 from the 3-point line. As for those Magic, you had Jonathan Simmons with 13 points, 5 of 11 shooting, hit 1-3 in that one. Evan Fournier with 22 points, 3 rebounds, shot 7 of 14, 2 of 4 from the 3-point line. Then you had uh, DJ Augustine who got to start in this one with no uh, with Alpha Payton going to uh, Phoenix. Looking like DJ Augustine is going to become the starting point guard for that team. He had 18 points, 9 assists, shot 5 of 14, 2 of 6 from the 3-point line. And then off the bench, you had Mo Spates with 14 points, 2 rebounds, 5 of 11 from the field, 4 of 9 from the 3-point line. I guess it works out for both teams. I mean, the Magic got to win. It's always nice to win when you're a bad team. And as far as the Hawks losing, I mean, they're trying to tank. So, I mean, any loss helps as far as draft positions. So I guess it's a win-win situation for both of these teams here. But once again, the Magic won this one, 198. Then you had the New York Knicks facing off with the Toronto Raptors in Toronto. And let me tell you this. Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan combined for 15 points. And they still ended up winning by 25. All right, the Raptors won this one, 113-88. to for the Knicks, you had Michael Beasley with 21 points, 7 rebounds, 1 assist, shot 7 of 13. Dude's been pretty lights out this season. I don't know why no one's talking about it that much. Tim Hardaway Jr. had not a good shooting night, actually. 9 points, 5 rebounds, 4 of 14 from the field, 1 of 6 from the 3-point line. Kyle O'Quinn, his names were going up in trade rumors, ended up staying with the Knicks. He had 9 points, 8 rebounds, shot 4 of 10, 0 of 1 from the 3-point line. Jarrett Jack, 23 minutes in this one, 10 points, 6 assists, 4 of 7 from the field. Then you had Courtney Lee, who played 28 minutes, only got 6 shots up and only hit one of them. He had 4 rebounds, 4 points, and 2 assists. As for the Raptors, you had Serge Ibaka with 13 points, 8 rebounds, shot 4 of 12, 3 of 7 from the 3-point line. Jonas Valanciunas, 18 points, 10 rebounds, shot 7 of 12 from the field, 2 of 3 from the 3-point line. And like I said, Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan had bad games here. Kyle Lowry had only 7 points, 3 assists, 2 rebounds, shot 2 of 10, 2 of 8 from the 3-point line. DeMar DeRozan, only 8 points in this one, 5 rebounds, 5 assists, shot 2 of 11, 1 of 5 from the 3-point line. I mean, the Raptors... Production is mostly coming out like it comes out of the bench we um day in and day out. That's one of the reasons why they're one of the best teams in these. You had Siakam went off the bench with 14 points, six assists, five rebounds, shot six of nine. CJ Miles 11 points, five rebounds, shot four of eight, three of five from the three point line. You had Fred Van Vliet with 10 points, six assists. 4 of 11 shooting, 2 of 5 from the 3 point line. Then you had right off the bench with 11 points, 3 rebounds, 3 assists, shot 5 of 6, and hit a 3 in that one. The only 3 he took, should I say. All right, and once again, Toronto won that one, 113-88. I mean, the Knicks are going to be losing a bunch of games, so I guess they're going to have a nice little draft pick. And I saw, too, that they might just not even have Porzingis out there come out next year, too, because I don't think he's going to be ready at the beginning of the season, obviously, with him turning his ACL. It's usually a year-long process to rehab. And like I said, if the Knicks are out there not playing well and pretty much nowhere to go, then I guess there really is no point to bring Porzingis back next year. Just go for another lottery pick again. So poor Knicks fans, though, can never have anything nice. I mean, such an overhyped franchise, all right? I think it's just because of the media outlet they got out there. But, I mean, the team that hasn't won a championship since 1975. They've really never been anything. I mean, Patrick Ewing, yeah. You got beat by Michael Jordan a whole bunch of times in the 90s. And, I mean, as far as the 2000s, 2010s, 2010, um, never really had much. Melo comes. 
that's cool. A couple of first round exits made it to the second round once, I think it was. I mean, never really amounted to anything. So, I mean, the Knicks are so overrated, dude. But nonetheless, let's talk about the Charlotte Hornets and Portland Trailblazers. The Portland Trailblazers won this game 109, 103 in overtime. For uh, Charlotte, you had Marvin Williams with 10 points, four rebounds, shot four of six, two of three from the three point line. Dwight Howard, not a good game from him, only seven points. Did have 15 rebounds, but shot thir- three of 11. Kimball Walker repaying Michael Jordan for not trading him. Kimber Walker goes out for 40 points, three assists, shot 13 of 26. 6 six of 11 from the three-point line. Nick Batum with 11 points, 5 assists, 2 rebounds. She got 5 of 15, 1 of 8 from the three-point line. Then off the bench, you had Frank the Tank Kaminsky with 17 points, 6 rebounds. Shot 6 of 14, 4 of 8 from the three-point line there. Jeremy Lamb got a, um, got a bunch of shots up. Had, took 11 shots, only made 3 of them. Had 7 points, so not a great game off the bench for him. As for the Portland Trailblazers, you had Alfa Camino, only 6 points in this one. Did have 15 rebounds, though. Joseph Nurkic, 24 points, 14 rebounds, 10 of 14 shooting. And you had Damian Lillard, not the greatest shooting net from him. 18 points, 8 assists, 4 rebounds, shot 6 of 22, 3 of 11 from the 3-point line. CJ McCollum with a bit of, a, of an efficient night here. 22 points, 3 assists, 4 rebounds, shot 7 of 18, 2 of 5 from the 3-point line. And then off the bench, you had Evan Turner with 13 points, 2 rebounds, shot 5 of 7, 1 of 2 from the 3-point line. As for Charlotte... Them not trading Kemba Walker at the trade deadline is kind of uh, like I kind of like I, I guess I get why they kept Kemba, but I mean Charlotte is not a good team with him, just like they wouldn't be a good team without him. He's pretty much a great player playing on a really ba- like playing playing in a really bad situation. So I mean I get like you want to keep your best players and all that, but unless they have like some little sneaky plan as to how they're going to come up with big free agents in in the off season and pretty much build this team up, I mean I don't really get what the point of keeping them is. Why not just send them to a good team? Like they could have sent them to a team like the Cavs probably. I'm sure they were trying to work out a deal or maybe like the Pistons and pretty much going to full tank mode cuz like I said, I mean Honestly, I don't really see the reason as to keeping them even in the offseason. I say they trade them in the offseason and try to get more. Because like I said, Kemba Walker is not going to help you really become a top team in the East or anything like that. I mean, it might just be the fact that the talent isn't all the way there or anything like that. I mean, Malik Monk really hasn't been doing much this season, the rookie they drafted. So I'm not really sure what to do for them. But like I said, if it was me, I'd trade Kemba Walker in the offseason. They probably should have just traded him at the trade deadline either way. But nonetheless, we'll see how it all ends up. All right. Then for the next game, we have the Dallas Mavericks facing off with the Golden State Warriors, and the Mavericks lost this one. Warriors won 121 to 103. You had Dirk Nowitzki with 16 points, 11 rebounds, shot 6 of 10. Dirk had a nice little move in this game right here. He was at the three point line, pump fakes Draymond Green. Draymond Green jumps, jumps past him. Uh, Dirk takes it to the elbow by the paint. Pump fakes again. Draymond Green jumps once again, and Dirk hits the little fadeaway shot that he always has in his career. And it was a little fun thing to watch right there. Derek, probably one of the most underrated players in the history of the NBA, if we're being real here. Dwight Powell had 18 points, 6 rebounds, shot 7 of 9 from the field. J.J. Burrell got the start in this one, only 6 points, 8 assists, shot 2 of 9, 0 of 5 from the 3-point line. Dennis Smith Jr. with 22 points, 3 rebounds, 3 assists, shot 8 of 18, 4 of 9 from the 3-point line. Wesley Matthews had 17 points, 2 rebounds, 2 assists, shot 7 of 17, 2 of 9 from the 3-point line. As for the Warriors, you had Draymond Green with 12 points, 6 assists, 10 rebounds, shot 4 of 17, 1 of 3 from the 3-point line. Then you had Kevin Durant, 24 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists, shot 8 of 13, 4 of 6 from the 3-point line. Steph Curry with 20 points, 8 assists, 7 rebounds, shot 7 of 12, 4 of 9 from the 3-point line. Then Klay Thompson, not the best game from him, from 3, hit 2 of out of his 6, um, six shots. Shot 8 of 15 from the field, had 18 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists. So a nice little game for the Warriors. Didn't need Steph or Clay to do too much, and they won this one big right here. As for the final game of the night, you had the Oklahoma City Thunder facing off with the Lakers in LA, and the Lakers won this one easily, 106 to 81. All right, you had Patrick Patterson, he got the start in this one, 0 of 6 from the field, 0 of 5 from the three point line, four rebounds, no points. Now, when Paul George did have 29 points, nine rebounds, three assists, shot 11 of 25. Stephen Adams, not a great game from him, only 13 points, nine rebounds, shot four of 11. Raymond Felton got the start for Russell Westbrook in this one. He had seven points, five rebounds, three assists, three of eight from the field, one of two from the three-point line. Nothing really notable from the bench um, of the Thunder. Then for the Lakers, you had Julius Randle, 17 points, six rebounds, eight of 16 from the field. Really surprised. I guess I'm not sure if I'm surprised, but I thought that he'd probably be one of the guys that gets traded at the deadline because I think he is on the last year of his deal here. So we'll see how it all ends up for him. Maybe the Lakers just bring him back because I think they should. He's been a nice little solid player for them this season. Then you had Brandon Ingram with 19 points, 6 assists, shot 7 of 11, 3 of 4 from the 3-point line. Contavious Caldwell-Pope with 20 points, 7 rebounds, shot 7 of 10, 3 of 5 from the 3-point line. 
Josh Hart with the start again in this one. 10 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists. Shot 4 of 9, 2 of 5 from the three-point line. Kyle Kuzma with 16 points, 9 rebounds, 2 assists. Shot 6 of 15 and 2 of 8 from the three-point line. Once again, the Lakers won that one. 106-81. Lakers were one of the winners at the trade deadline, dude. Right? Got rid of Ku- or got rid of Lance, got rid of Larry Nance and uh, Jordan Clarkson. Created some cap space. They got enough room to sign two max player contracts in the offseason. Now people are thinking, you know what? The Cavs just did the Lakers a favor, giving them an opportunity to sign LeBron James. But also, I mean, there's people saying that Cavs probably have a, have a good idea that he's not going to end up there if they're making that trade with them. Because I mean, if LeBron ends up going signing with the Lakers in the offseason, that's one of the worst tra- um, ca- um, trades the Cavs could have ever made. So we'll see how it all ends up. But that's going to wrap it up for this segment. Next up, we're going to be talking about the Baltimore Ravens. Got to get some NFL into this show. And then for the final segment, we'll be making my picks for tonight's games and pretty much doing a little weekend preview of anything going on in sports and pretty much talking about anything else that comes to mind. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. MC Sports Podcast. So far on the show, we talked about Markel Folks. We talked about uh, the NBA games from yesterday, and now we're going to talk about the Baltimore Ravens a bit. All right. So let's just get into it now, I guess. Let's talk about the Ravens. All right. Why are we talking about the Ravens? All right. NFL is over. And I mean, just the Ravens. All right. The Ravens are a non story, right? Well, I talked about it on the football podcast, I think it was last week, and talked about how the Ravens owner said that he did think about firing, at least it crossed his mind, he thought about firing John Harbaugh because they missed out on the playoffs. All right. And that got me thinking a bit. Oh, wow. So maybe John Harbaugh's job isn't in the uh, best position right now. I mean, the dude's one of the best coaches in the league. Playoffs are now. We know this, okay? It's no secret or anything like that. So then, I was like, uh, all right, I guess I maybe thought about it, but I mean, that's it. I just gave it a thought. And then he said, after in the press conference, that his job this year, John Harbaugh's, wouldn't just come down to him making the playoffs. Like, he wouldn't lose his job if he just missed out on the playoffs. And then I was thinking, you know what? I mean, if John Harbaugh didn't make the playoffs last year, and, or this past year, and you already thought, like, you just it just crossed your mind and you thought about possibly not bringing him back, then, I mean, if he doesn't make the playoffs this year, then I'm like, I, I was just thinking in my head, then there's no way they're going to be bringing him back. All right. The fact that it like just crossed his mind that they thought about f- um, firing John Harbaugh shows that he's a little bit on thin ice here. All right. And I th- don't think that the Ravens are going to be a playoff team in 2018. I just don't see it. All right. Unless. They sign a number, a true number one receiver, and someone who's going to contribute immediately. I mean, I just do not see them getting to um, get into the playoffs. And if they don't get to get into the playoffs, I think that John Harbaugh is going to be gone. All right, I don't see him coming back, whether it be him just leaving the team or whether it be the owner Steve Biscotti um, firing him. And once John Harbaugh leaves that team, whether it be after this year, then I think the Ravens are going to be a bad team for a while, all right? Because this team, like, I mean, they just finished 9-7 and seven this year, barely missed out on the playoffs, and that's not because of Joe Flacco or anything like that. I mean, Joe Flacco has not been good since the year, what was it? When, they, when did they go to the Super Bowl? 2012, the last time when they beat the uh, 49ers? And 49ers might be getting back there pretty soon if um, Jimmy Garoppolo turns out to be 
the quarterback that John Lynch and them expect him to be. But nonetheless, I mean, I don't know. 2012 was the Giants and Eagles. Let's see. All right, yeah. So 49ers 2013. Excuse me. All right. But um, that was actually a pretty good game there. Let's see. But nonetheless, getting back to it, I mean, and Joel Flacco in that game, he threw 287 yards, three touchdowns. I bet John Harbaugh would really wish he could do that now. All right, but getting back to the point. All right, so listen, John Harbaugh doesn't make the playoffs. I don't see him getting back to where, getting back to the Ravens after that. All right, and another thing too, Ozzie Newsom said after this year, he's going to be stepping down and he's going to be consulting with the team still, but he's still not going to have the same type of... Uh, pretty much the same type of role with him, right? He's going to be around and all that, pretty much peep his head in and work with him still, kind of like a Bill Parcells did when he left the Jets, I think it was, or it might have been a different team. It was either, I think it was the Jets. He was like, or he was going to become a consultant with the Jets and Bill Belichick was going to take over, but obviously that didn't work out too much. All right, so they're going to lose Ozzie Newsom. He's not going to be read in the little day-to-day -day operations of being a GM. All right, then if you don't make the playoffs, I'm like I'm saying, I'm betting on them getting rid of John Harbaugh. Those are two of the main reasons why this team has been able to compete for so long. All right. It's not because of Joe Flacco. It's not because of the running backs. It's not because of the receivers. All right. It's the defense and it's the coaching staff. All right. Without Ozzie Newsome and without John Harbaugh. All right. You got even you got on the defensive side. You got Terrell Suggs who's getting older. Yeah, the dude's still producing. But nonetheless, he's getting older. Father time is not. Um, is not defeated. He has not lost once. Father Time is undefeated. All right, got messed up on the saying a bit right there, but still made sense either way. All right, but nonetheless, I don't like the Ravens' future. All right, because think about it. You still got Pittsburgh, who's the top dog in that division. All right, they're still looking to. Uh, they're actually trying to extend Ben Roethlisberger. I was actually pretty surprised about that because I just really didn't think that. Uh, I just don't see the point of it right now. I guess adding another year to his contract because it's up in 2019 is just pretty much like a just-in-case type of thing if he doesn't retire because obviously we know the last few years Ben Roethlisberger has been entertaining that retirement talk. I mean, I'm not sure if he's actually thinking about it or if he just loves the fact that people ask him, oh, when are you going to retire and stuff like that because, I mean, Ben Roethlisberger, it's a, it's, would you consider Ben Roethlisberger a first ballot Hall of Famer? All right. I'm not sure, actually. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird weird question because I mean I say it all the time I consider Eli Manning a first ballot Hall of Famer I got to check the stats on I got to check what Ben Roethlisberger what his stats are all the time because I mean Eli Manning is top seven in touchdowns I think in top um six in yards so I mean that's what keeps him at least what I, th I think he's a top or a first ballot Hall of Famer but Ben Roethlisberger I have to go back and check his stats but then let's get back to it I mean he's going to be around there for a couple more years and it's not like his play has really diminished or anything like that. Yeah, you can tell he's getting a bit older, but it's not like anything like holding the team back where they got to figure out something else to do. All right, and if they re-sign Le'Veon Bell, then those are your division winners for next year, by far, without a doubt. All right, still got Antonio Brown locked up. Juju Smith-Schuster looking like uh, he's going to be a stud going forward. I mean, had a nice little rookie year. I mean, I guess you could say a great little rookie year, too. Wasn't like a rookie of the year candidate or anything like that, but you could tell that he's going to be... Well, they're number two receiver next year. And I think Matt Martavius Bryant's going to be gone, too. I mean, he's really, there's no point of having him on the team. He's too good to be a number three receiver. And, I mean, he's not good enough to be a number two receiver on the Steelers, if that makes any sense whatsoever. But I think all the Steelers got to do right now is just fix up the defense. And, I mean, like I said, even if they don't fix up the defense, then they're still the number one team in the AFC, AFC North. But, I mean, they fix up the defense, then they're back to being Super Bowl contenders once again like they already were this year. All right, so you got to worry about the Steelers now if you're the Ravens, all right? How about the Bengals? I'm not sure you really need to worry about them too much. I mean, the last two years, they've been a pretty bad team. They've been going down. Andy Dolan's look like he's starting to regress. And that's kind of weird to say, too, because he hasn't been in the league for that long either. It's not like he's been in the league for more than 10 years or anything like that. I don't think he's been in the, year for about, in the league for about five, six years, I think. All right, they still got A.J. Green. You got Joe Mixon, who showed signs of the kind of running back he could be this year. Just got to develop some more. You got a nice little number two in Brandon LaFell. Got to fix up that offensive line. And, I mean, the secondary is looking good for that team, so you got to fix up a bit on the defensive line and pretty much. I'm not sure what it is. I mean, this year it looked like for the Bengals, it looked like that. They were just pretty much tired of playing for Marvin Lewis, and they're ready for change. Obviously, the Bengals front office wasn't ready for it, so they gave, I think Marvin Lewis, what was it, a two-year extension after them for this year? So, I mean, Bengals is pretty much, they all got to get on the same page and want to play for Marvin Lewis. So, I mean, don't really got to worry too much about them. Then there's the Browns, all right? 
The Browns are probably the most intriguing team to me in the AFC North. No, they're not going to be a team that competes for the division, but I've said it and I'll say it again. That team is a seven-win team with Kirk Cousins as their quarterback at least. All right, at least a seven-win team with Captain Kirk there. And I'm saying that like even before the draft too. All right, because... I guess, I mean, I can't be saying that because if they send Kirk Cousins, I expect them to draft Saquon Barkley, and I think that's what completes it right there. But nonetheless, Ravens got to look out for the Browns. The Browns are not going to be the laughing stock of the NFL next year. All right. And I guess, uh, like right now, I'm just talking about if they draft Kirk Cousins. I mean, if they draft a guy like Sam, like, or if they sign Kirk Cousins, if they don't end up signing Kirk Cousins and he ends up in, like, the, with the Jets or with Denver, then, I mean, the Browns are still going to be a five win, six win team, maybe depending on how good the quarterback is that they draft. So, I mean, you got to worry about that still. But nonetheless, I mean, if the Browns end up signing Kirk Cousins, drafting Saquon Barkley, and pretty much doing well in those other picks that they have in the first three rounds, then the Ravens got to worry about them too. Because like I said, well, Kirk Cousins, that's seven wins right there for me. All right, Baltimore was a 9-7 and team and didn't look all that all too good this season. I mean, I don't think they're going to be getting any better. So, I mean, they have nowhere to go besides either just stay the same or go down. And if I had to put money on it, I'd say that the Browns, the Ravens are probably going to be a 7-9, 8-8 eight and eight team. And that's where you see a guy like John Harbaugh lose his job there. And if I'm John Harbaugh, I'm not going to be sweating it too much about me losing my job with the Ravens because there's a guy in Oakland who hadn't coached since like 2007, I think it was, who just got a 10-year deal worth $100 million. Yes, I'm talking about John Gruden for those who didn't know. All right. John Harbaugh, I don't think, is going to get 10 years, $100 million or anything like that. But we know what kind of coach he is. All right. We know what he can do. He's won a Super Bowl before. He's going to get paid. I'm not sure who is going to pay him, but he's going to get paid for sure. All right. Let's see real quick. Let's look at teams who, if they don't do well this season, you could see their coaches on the hot seat. Uh, there's teams like the Dallas Cowboys. That's a team actually right there. If Cowboys miss out on the playoffs, you could see Jason Garrett gone. Let's say John Harbaugh is available. I'm sure Jerry Jones is going to do whatever he can to get him over there. I mean, John Harbaugh with Dallas, with the Dallas Cowboys working with Dak and Ezekiel Elliott, that's nice to me right there. All right. Washington, I'm not too sure about them. Philly, obviously, they got their coach locked up for a while. Give that dude an extension already. Dude's looking like one of the best coaches in the league. Chicago just hired theirs. Detroit just hired theirs. Mike McCarthy, I mean, as long as they make the playoffs, his job is safe. Minnesota, they like Mike Zimmer. I don't see maybe Tampa Bay losing Dirk Cutter if they don't play well this season. Um, as for the other three, though, I mean, I don't see them losing their jobs. Let's see, NFC West, all of them have new coaches. Pete Carroll, I don't see him going anywhere either way. Uh, AFC East, Buffalo, I don't see them getting rid of their coach either way. Miami, that's a little intriguing team right there. Miami didn't make the playoffs, and they played poorly, and they don't draft a quarterback in the first round. I could see Gase get in the boot, all right, because they made the playoffs the first year. This year, they took a bit of a step back, and um, I mean, that could be due to the fact that just Tannehill tore his ACL on training camp, but nonetheless, if they don't draft a quarterback in the first round and just don't make the playoffs, then I can see Gase get in the boot, and I know that... Uh, Josh, Stephen Ross wanted Jim Harbaugh when he was available but couldn't get him. So, I mean, John Harbaugh would be the next best thing right there. Jets gave Todd Bowles an extension, I believe, so don't really got to worry about them. New England Patriots, Josh McDaniels is going to be taking over eventually. I don't see John Harbaugh going to the Bengals. Or, yeah, Marvin Lewis isn't leaving since he got his little extension. Cleveland, maybe, but that'd be kind of, I don't know, Cleveland and John Harbaugh after next year, that, that could work. All right, let's see. AFC South, they got their coaches. Or the Colts are going to have their coach. And as for the AFC West, I mean, if Denver stinks again, then maybe you see a guy like Vance Joseph go. I think Andy Reid is going to be with the Chiefs for a while. And then the Raiders and Chargers got their coaches. So, I mean, there's a couple of teams after this year. If they don't do too well, then John Harbaugh could end up there. All right. If they don't, if the Ravens don't make the playoffs again, it all depends on the Ravens not making the playoffs. And I know that Stephen Biscotti said that he's not going to be getting rid of Harbaugh. If they, they, he's, that's not going to be the sole reason. But if you already thought about it, then come on, dude. You can't fool any of us. But I said, like, think about John Harbaugh and the Dallas Cowboys. That would work. All right. So that's all I got to say about that. Just want to talk about John Harbaugh and the Ravens a bit. Also talked a bit about the AFC North, but pretty much tied that into the Ravens. So that's going to wrap it up for this segment. Next up, we're going to be talking about pretty much anything else going on in sports. Talk about the games going on this week and do a little weekend preview and then make my picks for the NBA games tonight. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. 
Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. For the NBA games tonight, and turns out Roy Jones Jr.'s last fight was yesterday night, which was Thursday. Yeah, Thursday night. I've been getting my days mixed up lately, man. But nonetheless, yeah, Roy Jones Jr.'s last fight was yesterday. All right, won by unanimous decision. Fought a dude named Scott Sigmund, I think it was. Jones finished his career with a 66 wins, nine losses, and yesterday I said that uh, he had a nice little career. I was wrong. All right. Ray Jones Jr. probably had one of the better boxing careers of anyone, all right? I've seen people say that he's a top three fighter, top five, stuff like that. Maybe he is, all right? Don't remember enough, but nonetheless, nice little career for Ray Jones Jr., all right? One of the best of all time? Uh, maybe, all right? But he did say, all right, was what he said was he directed it towards Dana White. He said the only fight he'll come out of retirement for now is against Anderson Silva. All right, says he knows Silva's suspended, but nonetheless... That's the only fight I'll come out for. And let me put it this way. I'm not sure if Roy Jones Jr. wins a fight against Anderson Silva, whether it's UFC. Well, he's never not winning a UFC MMA fight against Anderson Silva. I'll tell you that much right there. Don't ever put money on Roy Jones Jr. for a fight like that. All right. Does he beat Anderson Silva in a boxing fight? Ah, uh, Maybe. All right. I get Roy Jones Jr. is one of the better boxers ever. All right, but the dude is 50. I think Anderson Silva is only about 43, 44. It's about a six years difference. All right, that fight wouldn't happen this year, I don't think. So, I mean, another year. I think Roy Jones Jr. right now is 49. Not sure when he turns 50, but either way, he'll be a whole lot closer to 51 than Anderson Silva will. All right, so, I mean, you put these two in the ring, whether it be if it's an MMA fight, then Silva wins in about a couple seconds. If it's a boxing fight, I don't know. It depends how good a shape Ray Jones Jr. is. And I mean, he did fight a younger dude yesterday. So, I mean, we'll see about that. But nonetheless, I mean, would you pay for Anderson Silva, Ray Jones Jr. fight? Maybe you could throw it on the undercard of uh, the next fight between May- Mayweather and McGregor, which, I don't know, looking like they're going to be doing in the MMA ring if it does happen, if in the UFC octagon type of thing. So, I'm not sure. Maybe throw it on the other card there. Hmm. Still want to see Manu Pacquiao lose to uh, Conor McGregor in a boxing fight. Because I do think that would happen. Because, uh, you know, let me say this. Manny Pacquiao was overrated. All right. But nonetheless, I'm not sure. But Roy Jones Jr. finished out his career. Unless Anderson Silva comes back and says, yeah, let's fight Roy Jones Jr. So, there's that. All right. As for what to watch for this weekend. You got the North London Derby on Saturday, I believe it is. Need to double check that. But that's the worst thing about like watching the English Premier League, okay? The good games are either at 6... Like, well, all right, let me phrase it this way. Right? Living on the West Coast and, like, and watching the English Premier League kind of stinks because of the fact that it's in England. So the games on our side are going to be a whole, a whole lot early. Like, all right, North London Derby between Tottenham and Arsenal. It's going to be a good game, all right? This one's going to be at Wembley Stadium. Tottenham, the home team. All right, Arsenal's got a Bama Yang, Mkhitaryan. Looked really good their last game. They went against Harry Kane of Tottenham. All right, looking like Lucas is going to be playing. Dude from PSG who got transferred over. But I was like, huh, I'm going to watch this game. Then I saw, oh yeah, game's at 4.30 a.m. That's a pass. I will not be watching this game because I do not want to wake up at 4.30 in the morning. Maybe I will, but I probably won't. So not really too happy about that. 
All right, but nonetheless, it's going to be a good game. So if you wake up early enough, I think it'll be worth it. It's going to be a nice little high score game. So if you're not really your casual fan of soccer and stuff like that, and if you you feel like you can wake up at 4:30 for a game, or if you're on the East Coast, I mean, it doesn't really matter because it'll be at 7:30. That's where the East Coast where um lucks out as far as watching soccer in um in England. Right? They want to really say to wake up at 7:30. All right, it's the only time they got us people on the West Coast beat. That's it. Other than that, West Coast is by far better than the East Coast. But nonetheless, that's going on. And then on Sunday, you got the Boston Celtics facing off with the Cleveland Cavaliers at 12.30 Pacific time, 3.30 Eastern time. All right, this one's in Boston. Paul Pierce will be getting his jersey retired. I mean, if you remember, this is where the whole, uh, oh, is Isaiah Thomas supposed to have his jersey retired on that day? I mean, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. So... Now it's just the Paul Pierce jersey retirement night. And we're going to get to see the new look Cavs against the Celtics team. All right, going to see Rodney Hood, George Hill, Larry Nance, Jordan Clarkson, and LeBron versus the Celtics team. All right. I'm sure Kyrie Irving's going to be looking forward to it. Kyrie Irving's never going to say, oh, yeah, like I'm really getting up for this one. But you know he is. All right. I can't wait till that playoff series between them and the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, sorry, Toronto. I don't really believe in you guys too much. I think they're a good regular season team, but Kyrie Lowry's going to show me that he's going to he can hit a shot in playoffs when it matters. So we'll see about that. As for any good games going on Saturday, we got the San Antonio Spurs facing off with the Warriors on ESPN or on ABC, I should say, at five thirty Pacific time, eight thirty Eastern time. All right, that should be a fun game there. So a couple of good NBA games there. And I mean, that's pretty much those three games right there: the Tottenham and Arsenal game, Spurs Warriors, and Celtics. Cavaliers are probably the only three games to really look forward to this weekend. All right, let's make my picks for the games going on tonight in the NBA. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine games. Got a nice little slate of games going on tonight. All right, let's see. We got the Los Angeles Clippers facing off with the Detroit Pistons. Blake Griffin's first game against his former team. This one's on ESPN at four o'clock. I will definitely be watching this one. And you know what? Going with the Pistons, right? Looking real good with Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin, I saw a little uh, question, a little article on ESPN saying, can Blake Griffin be a franchise gay, like a franchise changer? Yeah. All right, if you saw, if you've seen what he's been doing with the, um, with the Pistons, sorry, I don't know why I drew a blank there, but yeah, what he's been doing with the Pistons, I mean, he's got that whole entire team playing a whole lot better. Andre Drummond looks like a completely different player, and then you got Reggie Bullock who's been stepping up, and same with Stanley Johnson. So, yeah, I think Blake Griffin could be a game-changing, franchise-changing type player. All right, and like I said, I got the Pistons against the Clippers in this one. So, I mean, it's going to be a nice little fun one to watch, and I think Blake Griffin's going to be real happy if they end up winning that one. All right, as for the next game, we get the New Orleans Pelicans facing off with the Markel Fultz-less 76ers, and this one's at home. I don't know who to go with in this one. Do I go with Anthony Davis, or do I go with Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons? I think I'm going to go with Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, all right? Pelicans are currently 14-13 and 13 on the road. 76ers are 14-10. and 10. Yeah, I'm going to go with the 76ers, all right? Then we got the Cavaliers facing off with the Atlanta Hawks. I'm curious about this game. I'm not sure if Rodney Hood and those guys are going to be out for um, out for this game. But I feel like you kind of need them to. You lost six players, so I'm not really sure who you could play. Or, like, like let's see, you play 12 guys, so you can have six. Yeah, they're going to have to have some of those guys playing. So I got the Cavaliers in this one winning, even if those four guys end up don't show um, end up not showing up. But, I mean, the Hawks are a bad team, so I got the Cavs winning this one. Cavs are 11-15 and 15 on the road. That's terrible. All right, then we got the Pacers facing off with the Boston Celtics. Celtics kind of off an, coming off of a nice little win against the Wizards. Celtics back at home. This is a back-to-back for them. I'm going to go with the Celtics. And they've been playing good basketball. Kyrie Irving's been looking good. Boston's currently the favorite team in this one, so I'm going to go with the Celtics, right? Pacers could knock them off, though. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but the Pacers are currently 11-14 and 14 on the road, so not the best road team. Then we got the Milwaukee Bucks facing with the Miami Heat. This one's at home. Dwayne Wade's going to be back in this one, I believe. So you know what? I'm going to go with the Heat. They're 13-12 and 12 at, at home. Bucks are currently 12-14 and at the um, um, in the road. I'm sure this game's going to be sold out since it'll be Dwayne Wade's first game back. And you know what? That atmosphere is going to have that team playing a whole lot better. So I'm going to go with the Heat in this one. Then we got the Denver Nuggets facing off with the Houston Rockets. Nuggets are a garbage team on the road. Seven and eighteen on the road. Rockets are twenty and six at home. James Harden, averaging thirty-one a game so far this season. Nine assists. Dude's been lights out. All right, you got Nikolai Jokic, who's been averaging sixteen and a half, ten rebounds, five um, assists. I gotta go with the Rockets in this one. All right, not really too difficult of a pick here. Rockets favored by eight and a half. I mean, I'm sure they'll win by double digits in this one. Maybe I don't know. Maybe 
the Nuggets will be able to cover. But nonetheless, I got the Rockets winning this one as far as the head-to-head game goes. All right, James Harden's going to have a nice little game from here. I'm going to go James Harden. I'm going to go on a limb here. He's going to score more than 35 today. All right, so that's my prediction for that game too. Then we got the Hornets facing off with the Utah Jazz. And I don't know. Kemba Walker had quite the game yesterday, dropping 40 points on the Trailblazers. Can he do it again today? Maybe. I'm not sure if Jay Crowder's going to be playing in this one. All right. Derek Rose is going to get bought out, so I don't really need to worry too much about him. Hmm. I'm going to go with the... I'm going to go with the Jazz since they're at home, all right? They're a nice little defensive team. Donovan Mitchell's kind of hit a bit of a Ricky wall here, but I think he's going to be able to pick it up against the Hornets. But I think Kemba Walker's going to go out for a nice little game too. Dude's going to be uh, relieved that he's not going anywhere and he's going to be staying in Charlotte because I know he did say he wanted to stay in Charlotte. So either way, though, I got the Jazz winning this one. Then we got Jimmy Butler's return to Chicago, I believe it is. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, this is his first year with the Timberwolves, so this should be his first um, return to Chicago. Jimmy Butler's never going to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to get up extra for this game and pretty much be ready. It's every like every other game. But I, see, I saw Taj Gibson say, we all know that's not the case if you know Jimmy Butler. I don't know Jimmy Butler, so I'm just basing it off of what Taj Gibson said. So I'm sure Jimmy Butler's going to be up and ready for this game, pretty much thinking about it all day. So I'm going with the uh, Timberwolves in this one easily. All right, Jimmy Butler's going to go off in this one. He's going to have probably one of the best games of his life, if we're being real here. I mean, especially Tom Thibodeau, too, against his former team. Yeah, I got the... I got the fight in Jimmy Butler's against the Chicago Bulls in this one. Jimmy Butler's going to go for at least 30. I have no doubts about that. All right, and then for the final game of the night, we got the Portland Trailblazers facing off with the Sacramento Kings. Kings really did not have a good trade deadline, all right? you trade. They traded away George Hill. Let's see, who else did they trade away? I think that was the only guy. Was that the only guy they traded away? I think George Hill's the only one they traded away. But um, they re- um, released George Papagiannis guy that drafted like 16th overall two years ago. So, I mean, as far as like how it all ended up, it's not going good for them. They're going to have to buy out Joe Johnson. Amon Shumpert's on that team. I mean, he really there's no really there's really there's no use for him on the Kings. So, I mean, the Kings just, it took a couple of steps back. Let's just say that, all right? Didn't really get any picks. Didn't get any younger. I think they did get a pick. Was it? I think they got someone's second round pick, I believe. So, I guess there's that. But nonetheless, I mean, the Kings just, I don't know. They're a weird team. But I got the Trailblazers one in this one. I think Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum are going to have a nice little game here. All right. To recap my picks, I got the Pistons beating the Clippers, the Sixers beating the Pelicans, the Cavs beating the Hawks, Celtics beating the Pacers, Heat beating the Bucks, Rockets beating the Nuggets, the Jazz beating the Hornets, Timberwolves beating the Bulls, and then the Trailblazers beating the Kings. I don't think I have any upset picks going on tonight, and usually that pretty much doesn't work out. I think the one I'm for sure going to get wrong is the Pelicans and Sixers picks, but I'm still going to go with the Sixers either way in this one. So that's going to wrap it up for the show. Today we talked about Markel Fultz, talked about that little weird injury situation he's got going on over there in Philly. Then we talked about the NBA games from last night, talked about the Baltimore Ravens, talked about if John Harbaugh gets fired, where could he possibly end up after this year? And then we talked about what to watch for this weekend. Roy Jones Jr. finishing up his last boxing fight of his career, only coming back. He said if he fights Anderson Silva. And uh, we t- uh, made my picks for the games tonight. So like I said, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks for listening to the GSMC Sports Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jesse Tapia. We'll be back on Tuesday, so stay tuned, and we'll talk to you later. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program